Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and David Bartke here. It's Thursday, June 8th, and once again, time again to do the Law of Attraction here on PRN and on our podcast and all our listeners in iTunes Store and everywhere else. We are going to start doing something that uh, Joel Nelson and I started in April before his commitments took him away and we weren't able to finish it. Uh, David, we actually did one episode on The Secret. Oh, nice. And we just, nice. It, it just, we never finished it. We, we, we did Think and Grow Rich. We did the whole book, Think and Grow Rich. That was wonderful. We said, well, let's do it with The Secret. And then yes. you know, my, our partnership fell apart. So, <laughs> yeah. So you and yeah. I figured, well, let's see if we can, you know, pick up where we left off last time. Actually, let's pick up at the beginning because you kind of have to do it from the beginning. And, All right, and just so people know who I am and why I'm on this call is that um, I'm a certified and a very experienced law of attraction life coach. So that's how I fit into all this. Oh, absolutely. I, otherwise, I wouldn't make you my co-host. <laughs> you got to have exactly. the background, for goodness sake. <laughs> I just wanted people who are listening to know who I am. Well, that, that's absolutely <laughs> fair. So yeah. The Secret. The Secret came out, uh, what was it, 2007, I think it came out, something like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. it pretty much took the world by storm. There were large chunks of worldwide population that just really bought into it. There were perhaps even larger chunks that said, well, that's a bunch of hooey. And there were a, a, a smaller number of people who ignored it, but it was pretty big. In fact, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, Rhonda Byrne, who was the producer of The Secret, um, I believe she grossed somewhere around three hundred million off of it. So it was a pretty wow. successful movie, as these things go. Wow! Yes, yes. And of course, uh, published the book that was basically a transcription of the movie. When you really come down to it, mm-hmm. I mean, it has a few small mm-hmm. variations, but uh, it's essentially the same thing. And obviously, we're going to be working off the book because that way we can read it. It's kind of hard to read the video when you're watching the video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, let's start off with Chapter 1. Chapter 1, that's what we'll do this week, The Secret Revealed. And uh, the movie starts off and the book starts off with a whole bunch of quotes from many of the people who are presenters in the movie. And they're basically, you know what they're doing? They're teasing us. They're, 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 they're teasing us with all these wonderful things that the, that the, the secret is going to reveal to us and in, in very generic and abstract terms, but they sound so cool. Um, Bob Proctor saying, the secret gives you anything you want, happiness, wealth, health. Uh-huh. Joe Vitale says, you can have, do, or be anything you want. And you know, it sounds you know, like great pie in the sky. <laughs> but yeah. it's also a good way yeah. to get you to listen and say, okay, so what's this, what's this big secret they're building up to here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I have to tell you, honestly, when I first saw the secret, when I first came on, my skepticism uh, barrier, I guess you might call it, popped right into place i said oh it's one of these things yeah <laughs> i mean i don't know what was your reaction when you first saw it well i just was immediately into it because i was actually lucky enough to actually study under one of the people involved with the secret be- you know way before they did the secret oh, okay so you actually so had like a heads of... up before it even got out there yeah a little bit yeah and it was with um Mike will back with, and he has this wonderful uh, agape service in L.A., and I was living in L.A. at the time, and he just does these amazing sermons. I mean, talking about, like, raised vibration and all that kind of thing. By the time you listen to a sermon, you're just like, woo! <laughs> like, <laughs> I can do anything. Anything can happen. So he, he had a bunch of classes that he taught at the time, and I took all of them. So I was, you know, it wasn't that foreign to me. So I was just like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. Great. You know, more more law of attraction information. Yeah. That sounds good Filling to me. Filling in your education. What did you think, though, the first time that you heard Beckwith? Uh, the very first time I was like, wow. Because someone, someone had told me, oh, you got to go to hear this guy, Michael Beckwith, at his agape service. And I'm like, you know, it was a friend of mine who I really trusted. I'm like, okay. You know, they said, oh, you, you got to go. It's amazing. So I went, and he was amazing. And I was like, wow. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what's happening, but I just feel amazing after hearing him talk. And I just related to it. So you could actually and, physically uh, feel an, an increase in your vibration level. And you could feel an energy. Totally. Yes, totally. 
totally. Yeah, I can see how that and would really he, sell me. If, if I had had that, when I was watching The Secret, I wasn't getting this big vibrational increase. But I can, I can right, see if you're in an right. atmosphere where you're just feeling a <laughs> physical increase, you may not know what the heck it's all about, but you can definitely notice it. Yes, and, and everything he said, like, maybe I didn't fully understand it, but I understood it enough at the time where it just resonated with me and the way he talked and preached and you really, I mean, I'm sure everyone in there, that's why he became so popular, just felt that, like, raise in vibration and like, wow, yes, 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 keep it coming, yes, you know. So, uh, and, I, and then I started going weekly to his service and... Uh, which was really interesting because when I first started going, it wasn't that big of a group. And each week, more people came, and then more people came, and then you know, word, I guess word was spreading. Oh, sure. And it got so big, he had to move to, like, this huge place. And then even that, like, to go to the service, if he didn't get there early, the line would be huge to get wow. in. Wow, yeah. Yeah, it was, pretty, it, it was pretty amazing. Well, it shows what word Very of mouth amazing. can do. I mean, word of mouth is powerful. Yes, yes, and just, you know, have, when you have that gift of raising a large group of people's vibrations at once, people want that, and, and people tell other people about it, and they want to experience it. It's almost like a natural form of morphine or something. Get, 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 get your, your excitement level up. And, and actually yeah. it is when you think yeah. about it, because um, science has already, over the last 30, 40 years or so, has identified things like endorphins and serotonin and dopamine That's and so right. forth, which are the chemicals that get involved whenever we're feeling up, when, we're, when our vibration level is raised. So it makes sense. Mm -hmm. It makes total sense. Mm -hmm. And then plus, I started seeing and feeling improvement in my life from going to his services and taking his classes and absorbing the information. So I'm like, there's definitely something to all this because not only am I feeling amazing, I'm starting to attract things that I really wanted to have happen, and they're, it's happening. Yeah. <laughs> so, so something's working about it, you know? Now, when Rhonda Burns starts the movie off, she basically starts by saying, a year ago my life had collapsed around me. I worked myself into exhaustion. My father died suddenly. My rela relationships with my work colleagues and loved ones were in tor turmoil. And out of my greatest de despair came the greatest gift because her daughter gave her a copy of a book that – it presented this this idea that she had never been exposed to before and she started doing the research and she lists a whole bunch of people from from history who she identifies as being early practitioners of what she calls the secret you know, the list includes mm -hmm. people like William Shakespeare Robert Browning William Blake Ludwig von Beethoven uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, Socrates Plato Ralph Waldo Emerson Pythagoras Sir Francis Bacon, Sir Isaac Newton, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Victor Hugo. I mean, th that's quite a diverse and eclectic list right there. Wow, absolutely. I, I wish she had put why. That would be interesting. Like, well, you know, this person I feel was in on it because this reason and this person for this reason. Yeah, I, 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 had, I, I, I remember hearing the list, and I remember feeling on the one hand, well, okay, those are some pretty good names. Where's the evidence? Yeah, I'd love yeah, to see the yeah. evidence, and I can't honestly say exactly. I've done. I, I can't say I've done the research to find out what the evidence <laughs> was. Um, yeah, I mean, some of it I can kind of sort of see. Um, for instance, Da Vinci, he's already associated with a number of of ahead of his time things anyway. So yeah, I could kind of see where you know he would perhaps have bought into this idea on some level, but I still don't know where she found it in his work that showed the actual yeah. did. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it would be cool to, to discover that. That might be something to look into sometime. And and I have to say, that is one of my criticisms of The Secret. I would love to see her do less of the excitement building in order to spend a little more time presenting the evidence. Because evidence itself yeah, can agree. also be yeah. excitement building. You don't have to do it just oh, based absolutely. on hype, you know? Yes, totally. And then people can say, oh, there's the evidence. Yes, that makes sense. <laughs> that, you'd probably that end up with a, you'd end up with a lot less um, criticism too. A lot of less people saying, "Oh, you know, that's just a bunch of hooey." Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But uh, hey, the, the fact that uh, she put it out there is still good. So you know, we'll give her credit for that. <laughs> so, yeah. so when I'm I'm giving criticisms, it doesn't mean that I don't like the secret. It just means I think there are a few areas where she could have done a little bit better. <laughs> yes. 
yeah, that makes sense. Yes. Now the other thing that's really cool is she she uh, is Australian. She was an Australian TV producer, um, which is how she had access to you know teams of uh, videographers and so forth that that she could bring together to do this whole project of building the movie called The Secret. Um, but she also was smart enough to realize through her research that most of the practitioners of what she called The Secret were in the U.S., so she moved to the U.S. with her team in order to track them down uh-huh. and find them and video them. And, Interesting. And I'm glad she did because by doing that, she introduced me to some people who are now among my favorites. Yep. I mean, probably the yep. only one I already knew was um, Jack Canfield, who was the author of the uh, Chicken Soup series of books. Yes. I yep. was aware of him. I didn't really know any of the others. Same here, yeah, so, except for Michael. I know you knew Michael was, Beckwith. Yeah, I didn't know, I yeah. never heard of Michael Beckwith. Um, yeah. I, but one of my favorites that, he, that she introduced me to was Mike Dooley, who in the movie says thoughts become things. He basically lays it down mm-hmm. into like three words. And there was something about Mike. I mean, he, he's a very exuberant personality anyway. You can just tell he's just mm-hmm. full of, of happy energy. You know? <laughs> but it's also, I mean, he, when, when I was, uh, after I had seen the movie and had digested it for a year or two and read the book, I wanted more. I wanted to understand better what was going on with it. I wanted to fill in some of the gaps that didn't make a lot of sense to me. And so I, I was looking out on the net trying to find what some of these presenters had done on their own. And the stuff that Mike Dooley yes. did was spot on. I loved his stuff. Yeah. So I was really grateful yeah. that uh, The Secret introduced me to Mike Dooley. And there were so many others that you could draw upon. Interesting side note, and I'll, uh, we, we try to stay positive in this show, but I, I feel like I have to throw this one in. This is important. <laughs> okay. Rhonda Byrne and some of the, her presenters – and the guy who um, uh, was basically her director of, of videography and the guy who did her social media promotion um, that helped spiral the thing out of control. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. A number of them have a bitter taste in their mouths today. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, sad. Do you know why? Like, what happened? Um, well, a lot of it we can only surmise because there were lawsuits. Right. And I've oh, actually God. spoken to the guy who uh, built up the social media site. I had a conversation with him by phone one time, and uh-huh. he couldn't tell me as much as he wanted to tell me because of the way those suits were settled. They were they were settled with wow. uh, court orders that you can't discuss certain things. <laughs> you know, so but 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 it was very clear. His name was uh, Dan Hollings. Uh, and uh-huh. It's very clear from what my conversation with Dan was that there was a lot going on that we didn't know about. And while yeah. he couldn't tell yeah. me any of it, um, he, I picked up just through inference a couple of ideas on where to look. And one of the things I found was an article in an Australian magazine called, not surprisingly, The Australian, <laughs> which uh-huh. is kind of Australia's <laughs> version of Time or, or Life or something like that. It's, oh, it's okay. a major publication. And uh, there's an article, it's still online, you can still track it down, that talks about uh, Rhonda Byrne and how her phenomenal success with The Secret came at a price, at a cost to the people who helped her. And it goes into a lot more detail wow. than, than Hollings wow. you know, was able, what was because you know, he was uh, literally judicially prescribed from talking. But the magazine uh-huh. wasn't judicially uh-huh. prescribed, so if you want to find out what the negative side was, yeah, some of it's pretty bad. I mean, a couple of them, John Asaroff, one of the presenters, went, ended up being convicted of manslaughter because he, he tried to take the teachings too far and forcing people to do things that he really shouldn't have been forcing oh them to do. God. He actually ended up killing yes. people. Um, wow. Other people who were uh, – Dan Hollings hinted – he wouldn't say who. He hinted that some of the presenters were actually frauds, that what they claimed they were done they oh, had not no. actually done. <laughs> yeah, so so there is that. Well, side. I know, um, and I think I had told you this um, on the phone the other day, was um, I had heard Esther Hicks talk about the secret. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, anyone who's into law of attraction probably knows about Abraham and Esther Hicks. And they were originally asked to be part of it, and originally they were going to be part of it. And then without disclosing what, she said, as time went on, it started becoming different that they had originally been told it was going to be. And as a result, she backed out of the whole thing. Yeah, there's, there's so, actually a version of The Secret that includes Esther Hicks. 
Yeah. You can actually find yeah, it I on heard YouTube. That before, yeah, it's a little difficult to find. Yeah, very yeah. difficult to find. It took me a long time, and I'm good at searching. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so there, there was definitely some behind-the-scenes drama, <laughs> but uh, but it still was great that it came out because it just made people, oh, yeah. the public in general, became more, much more aware of Law of Attraction. And you're right. Once you discover um, the secret and the law of attraction, if you are drawn into it, if you aren't turned off by it, within a year or two, you're going to find Abraham Hicks. It, it, it's, it's almost a certainty. <laughs> you, if, you, if you've explored one and you're into it, you're going to find the other one. Yes, so Abraham sure. Hicks actually benefited tremendously well from the secret. Oh, yeah, I agree. Yep. And it, yeah, a lot of people, there were other people that just wrote law of attraction books that were not involved with the secret, but because of the secret, suddenly their books were selling like hotcakes. Right, cakes. exactly. Yeah. So there was a lot of good trickle effect just from that as well. <laughs> that would have been a nice trickle to be part of. <laughs> I know, unfortunately, my books weren't out yet, <laughs> but that would have been yeah. nice, yes. But Okay, so we've done the, the negative side. We can go back to the positive side now. Okay, we, good. We, we can leave the dark side of the force. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that they do early on as as they well first uh it's bob proctor who identifies what the secret is the secret is the law of attraction and then they describe what the uh -huh. law of attraction is and they, they discuss that a bit and pretty quickly pretty early on they start addressing the question of why is it that people don't always seem to get what they're thinking about you know, why, why is it that the law of attraction doesn't seem to work for some people? And I got to give them credit. They, they dove into that fairly early in the process. Um, uh -huh. One of the things they did that to, to try to address that, it, it's, it's a, 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 how do I describe that? It sounds like a good explanation at first on the surface. But when you look at it more deeply, you realize that they oversimplified. Because what they said uh -huh. was, you want to avoid um, thinking about things in terms of negation. So, um, and, and that if you use negation, the universe ignores it. So they say, if you say, I don't want to spill something on this outfit, it's as if you say, yeah. I want to spill something on this outfit exactly. and I want to spill more things. Yeah. Yeah. The problem that I have with that is that it isn't the negation. It's the negative vibration. It's the low level of vibration that's doing it because you're focusing on bad stuff. So yeah, so it isn't that you're actually I, saying I, I want think, to spill things on. I think on. it was said like, but I think it was possibly said like that to make it sound easier to the general person because because some people that don't know about vibrations and all that kind of thing might not get it. Yeah, I'm sure that's but why it was. If they, but but yeah, it also but just say, oh, it also created yeah. a problem for me because it confused me. Because I tried, uh -huh. I tried to apply the rule universally, and I found that it didn't always apply the way they wrote it. Uh -huh. You know, uh -huh. what I needed to understand was it's the feeling associated with the negative stuff that you're talking about. That's what's doing it. Yeah, and they actually yes. do touch on that, but you have to wait till like chapter four or five before you get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it would have been helpful that's, for me if they had touched on it in chapter one, but that's okay. <laughs> that's interesting because. Um, the type of coaching I do is phone coaching, so I get a lot of calls from potential clients, and they've watched The Secret or read The Secret, and they resonate with it, but they don't know what to do to get law of attraction to work in their favor. Mm -hmm. So I always found that interesting, like that they watch The Secret and read it, but they still don't know what to do. So maybe that's part of what you're talking about. Yeah, the, the practical application is touched on but it's not really laid out i don't think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not no uh, yeah and i think part of it is because whenever we're presented with something anything doesn't matter what it is that seems a little otherworldly a little bit you know out there mm -hmm. we have our skepticism <laughs> thing in the way right our our, our little barrier yeah. little protection barrier and so in yeah, order to, like is this really yeah, yeah. Is it re how yeah. could this be real you know yeah. And in order to get around that little protection barrier, that skepticism, you need to have a feeling that your 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 feet are firmly on the ground that you're you're actually dealing with reality, which is mm -hmm. in in the long run as you look at how the law of attraction actually works, that's really kind of naive. 
<laughs> because reality ain't all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> exactly. And the, right, the more we focus on reality, the more we're keeping that the same. But nevertheless, yeah. when we first approach it, we need to have that real basis. <laughs> you know? and, yeah. and that's yeah. what I think they, they actually need to spend a little more time on, helping provide a real basis for it. So, I mean, they, they tried. I, I'll give Rhonda and her team credit. They tried by, by taking this thing, this approach about avoiding the negation words in, in what you say. Mm-hmm. What, mm-hmm. what was missing from that, and the reason that it would not tend to work for me and for others who got tripped up on it was, yes, you can turn your words around. Instead of saying, I don't want to spill something on this outfit, you can say something like, I'm going to keep this outfit clean. And that that helps. Mm-hmm. But if you're saying that mm-hmm. in such a way, and this is where most of us are starting from, if you're saying it in such a way that you're not really feeling it, you're yeah. just trying, you know, yeah. you're faking it till you make it. Well, fake it till you make it is certainly a, a good technique to use. But you have to recognize that while you're faking it, you're not there yet. Right. You're, you're, you're right. not in that positive yeah. feeling space yet. So you yeah. can't expect it to just be working off the bat. But that's precisely <laughs> what we expect. We expect it to work right off the bat. Well, the, yes, there's that. Plus, there's momentum. Like if we're all used to thinking a certain way for many, many, many years, then we, you know, we can't just expect. Boom, we're just going to suddenly think about what we want, and then there it is. Right. You have to build that up. But that, but that, that's, that, see, this is where I, I didn't like the build up. The build up mm-hmm. was pie in the sky. And pie in the sky mm-hmm. is pie in the sky because it sounds so easy. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. you know, you just snap your fingers and wonderful things happen. <laughs> yep. So that yep. kind of bugged me. And that, I think that's why it took me so long to learn how the law of attraction really works, first of all. And second of all, learn how to apply it. Learn how to turn it yeah. into real life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But again... So what else does it say in chapter but one? But again, those are, those are just criticisms. I mean, it's still, for the, for the most part, the fact that they're presenting it at all is fantastic. So what else does it talk yeah, about? Yeah, totally. Um, well, one of the first introductions from Michael Breckwith is one of the first steps where you start to understand in a very early stage how right. it is that this thing, this, this concept that we're talking about, becomes a part of your life. He writes and says, Creation is always happening. Every time an mm-hmm. individual has a thought or a prolonged chronic way of thinking, they are in the creation process, and something is going to manifest out of those thoughts. Mm-hmm. Which I like because he isn't saying he isn't saying I'm going to attract X. Right. He's saying if you have a thought pattern, something of some kind is going to emerge out of that thought pattern. Yeah. It's much yeah. Le- it, it's yeah. much less specific. It's not like I'm going to cause this to happen. I'm going to cause X yeah. to happen. It's more like if I think about things of type Y, I'm going to get stuff of type Y happening. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. more generalized. Yeah, so it makes it easier to understand as well. It, it, it opens up the mind, too. It makes us realize yeah. that this isn't a one-to-one correlation. It's not like I'm driving by hitting the gas pedal, and now the car is moving forward, and I can always count on the car moving forward every time I hit the gas pedal. It's not quite that direct. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he, he's the one. Who, now, unfortunately, this is where a lot of critics also say this starts to become like mysticism. And I think it's a valid complaint but it's also because of the way they set the thing up from the beginning i would have liked the more realistic one but anyway I'm, i've been harping on that too much let's move on <laughs> okay <laughs> he also says uh again this is back with you attract to you the predominant thoughts that you're holding in your awareness whether those thoughts are conscious or unconscious and that's the rub that's the rub this is where they start bringing in the idea that it's not just what you think about that's positive Mm-hmm. It's what you think about that's negative, and it's not just what you think about consciously; it's what you think about unconsciously. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And that's where th- that w- this this came to me pretty quickly watching The Secret, which was, wow, how do I control all those negative subconscious thoughts? <laughs> that's right. That's right because it works both ways. Yeah, that that that's a little bit um, mind-boggling. Because of this, this, this. Recognition that subconscious is just as important as conscious, that unconscious is just more, as important as conscious. We need to pay mm-hmm. as much attention as we can to our unconscious minds. 
And I have to admit, I spent a lot of time over the last 10 years or so trying to learn exactly how to do that. And what did you find? It's been an ongoing step-by-step thing. It's not like I have had one great big aha moment. It's Mm -hmm. more like a lot of little aha moments. Um, Probably the most recent one, I am currently reading a book by Dr. Candice Pert, who Mm -hmm. was a neuroscientist whose career started in the early 1970s. And she was the researcher who discovered the opiate neuro... Um, receptor in the nervous system. Wow. Mm-hmm. And she also had some other uh, later discoveries, too. She posits her own theory. Uh, the book is called Molecules and Emotions, and her theory is mm-hmm. essentially that uh, science needs to include emotions in its scientific explorations, even though emotions can't be measured, which is abhorrent to, to scientists. Mm-hmm. Um, And she recognizes that it's abhorrent to scientists. But her research has shown her that the two are so inextricably connected that you can't talk about one without talking about the other. Wow. And in regard to what we're talking about here, her big observation, her big discovery, if you will, um, in this regard, is that the subconscious mind is the human body. Hmm. Uh-huh. It's not just some metaphor. It's not just some abstraction of you know some lower le- level of the brain or something like that. The body itself right. is the subconscious mind. And her evidence for that, uh, it, because everything about her is evidentiary, her, her uh-huh. evidence is how memory is stored. Memory is not just stored in the mind, it turns out. Uh-huh. Memory is stored uh-huh. in the form of peptides in the body in two different uh, kinds of storage spaces, if you will. One space uh, controls memory, and the other space controls, I can't remember what it is. Um, I, I, there's a, there's like a, a corollary to memory, and, and I just can't remember what it is. But, but the point is, this stuff is, is stored all over the body in various places. It's stored at the brain stem. It's stored um, at the, uh, the base of your spine. It's, it's, stored, it's wow. stored all over the place. And all of it is stuff from our experience that has been stored in certain ways in the body using chemical storage, essentially. Uh We we are chemical hard drives. (laughs) (laughs) When When we have somebody who has a repressed emotion, it simply means that it's a, that is a stored piece of stuff in peptide form somewhere in the body that our conscious mind refuses to connect to. Wow. Could, did she say anything about can that affect people's health? Oh, absolutely, or, yes, uh, in a huge way. Is it, yeah, it seems like it would. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. She she does more than any other neuro researcher that I know of to draw scientific connections to what um, alternative medical practitioners, um, law of attraction mm-hmm. practitioners, um, mm-hmm. Any of the the woo woo sciences, <laughs> she, yeah, yeah, she she yeah. ties a lot. When, when she, she unfortunately she passed about four years ago, but uh, but while she was still alive, she she was one of the few scientists who were willing to give talks to general audiences. Most most mm-hmm. science, scientists stay within their little scientific community. And they, 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 <laughs> the safe. Well, the safe. Spot. It's not just yeah. safe. It's also there, there's a bit of snobbery there. They like, oh like they don't want to release their their secrets, um, and and part of it is because of the way science works today. And she goes into a whole thing about this. Mm. And I won't spend a lot of time on it, but uh, p- particularly right. in the '70s and '80s, and I gather it still is true to some extent today. Science is an extremely competitive environment um, because the more kudos you get, the more citations you get, the more recognitions you get, more published papers that are, that are published first, and so forth. The more grant money mm-hmm. you get, the better offers you get, oh, and so I on see. and so forth. Right. So, right. so it, uh, especially with, when it was all the old boy network, and even today, it's a tremendously competitive environment. And in that environment, people want to hold their secrets. So when somebody goes out mm-hmm. and starts p- preaching to the public about, you know, let's turn all this into the vernacular, a lot of scientists get their back up. They, they, huh. they do not mm-hmm. like that at all. And they're, they're usually the ones who criticize um, the content of what is explained in that way the most because they're so resistant to the idea that the general public should understand any of their stuff. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. Which is sad, really. But credit to her, all credit to her, because she basically threw all that out the window. Because she experienced the the, uh, the gender um, discrimination that occurred, because it was an old boy network. And yeah. she had a numerous yeah. instances where, I mean, she, she played that lead leading role in discovering the receptor for opiates within the, within the body. Wow. She was... Uh, there, there was a, a team, a, a group of uh, researchers who were nominated for a top medical field prize called the Lasker, which is very similar to the Nobel. Mm-hmm. And she was one of the leading researchers to, you know, break the whole field open, and she was omitted from the list. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wow. So she became very early on a resistor and was actually blacklisted for quite some time mm. within the scientific oh community. Yeah, it's really something. It, and it it kind of makes sense. Wow. I mean, the 70s and 80s were very much a, you know, a gender revolution time anyway. So this is just one more piece to that puzzle. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. it also shows just how important it is to have the connections between science and general public. And it also shows yeah. that – the pe- the few who have been willing to do it are truly heroes. She's one of the heroes. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. But to answer your question, um, there are numerous instances from her research and from her colleagues' research um, showing that there is definite connections, lots of definite connections between how we think and how we feel and so forth. On the one hand, yes. and what happens to us medically. Mm-hmm. Gigantic mm-hmm. amounts of, of research supporting that. Wow, yeah. and it makes sense. It, it, it makes does. Sense, yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, uh, she even describes a conversation she had with Norman Cousins. You know who Norman Cousins is? Yes, I've definitely heard right. of Norman Cousins. Yeah, Norman Cousins, he was a TV producer, but he was also famous because he cured his own cancer by watching Marx Brothers movies. Amazing. Long before Amazing. any of that was considered to be even close to scientific. And, and his, his mm-hmm. book, of course, was roundly criticized. <laughs> of course. <Yeah. laughs> but it turns of out course. he was right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uncomfortably yeah. so, but he was right. Mm-hmm. What you think about is mm-hmm. what you attract. And, uh, yep. yeah, so th- this is, uh, it, it's, a, it's encouraging to those of us reading about the secret or reading about the law of attraction now because there is a lot of science behind it. Not, I don't mean to imply yeah. that scientists back the law of attraction. Most do not. But the science mm-hmm. itself backs it in many, many yes. ways. Mm-hmm. And that's the encouraging thing. But, yeah, doesn't that have that whole thing have to do also with the quantum physics that's proven like energy attracts like energy? Like oh, if you really want to get into a fist that. fight, say that to, to most <laughs> quantum physicists because most quantum physicists will just reject it outright. They're a bunch of woo woo, oh, okay. a bunch of nonsense. It's just, you know, they're, well, <laughs> they're just twisting and that's turning all always, the quantum that's what physics. I've always heard. They're, they're just twisting mm-hmm. quantum mechanics around to make it fit their woo woo spiritualism. You know? <laughs> So even there, there's a lot well, of Well, that's what I've heard. Yeah. But I have to admit, for me, quantum mechanics makes a huge difference. Um, mm-hmm. Not so much – well, it's quantum mechanics, but it's more specifically the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Because when I first read about that, I had to read it twice. Mm-hmm. Like, wait a minute. A scientific experiment was done where they were observing stuff at a nuclear level – and they expected to find an electron in one place, but when they looked, it was in another place. Hmm. But when they just left the equipment running without anybody watching and then just did some recording, it was back where it was supposed to be. So, so in other words, the observer influenced where the electron went just by observing. Um, uh, wow. And, and when I read that, it took me a long time to even accept that, it, that the data was correct. Because think about what that implies. It suggests that, I mean, this is just one experiment with one electron in one field under one electron microscope. If that's happening all the time, and there's no reason to believe that it isn't if that data is true, right. then right. everything we think we know about physics is misleading. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> because there's no such thing as objectivity anymore. Objectivity is now impossible. Because what's objectivity? It's it's separating yourself from the thing that you're observing so that you don't influence it. Well, guess what? Mm-hmm. The act of observing influences it. <laughs> well, that means there's no such thing as objectivity. Objectivity is now impossible. 
I mean, that that's mind bending, and and that mm-hmm. that really upset my world when I first heard about that. But over time, yeah, so that to grasp, it, it's yeah. a lot. It's a huge, a, lot, a huge amount to grasp. This whole concept that observation influences scientific study is it, it basically reminds us that scientific study is only as good as the insight of the person who's the scientist. And that's critical. <laughs> it also reinforces something. This is something else I've done a little study on lately. It reinforces what we know about healing, particularly where the placebo effect is concerned. I mean, the placebo effect, uh-huh. scientists have basically, for the for longest time up until about 20, 30 years ago, they just kind of dismissed the placebo as something that doesn't really contribute anything to medicine. Uh-huh. You know, it was just sort of there, and you, and you want to try to eliminate it from your scientific studies as much as you can so you can get published and you know get your stuff bought by the pharmaceuticals or whatever. <laughs> but what, we, what we're learning in the last 20 to 30 years is that the placebo effect is huge. It's a gigantic yeah. thing. It's so big. There was one researcher I read who uh, basically went through all the papers he could find and totaled up all the scores, so to speak, and found that the – success rate of the of all the various things that he found papers on was on average about equal to the placebo rate wow amazing so in other words if if somebody finds something odds are 50 50 that placebo will work just as well (laughs) (laughs) well what's placebo it's mind over matter it's believing that you know, this, this harmless, useless thing that you you ingest is just as powerful as some amazing new medical cure. Yes. Yep. It's the power of, yep. of positive thinking and positive suggestion. Yeah, I've, I've heard that as well with people that can feel, like, anxious. Like, they'll give them just a placebo pill, and they'll say, oh, this is something that's going to help you feel calmer in a few minutes. And the person takes it thinking that. And then a few minutes later, like, yeah, I know it's working. I feel calmer. Oh yeah. And it was just the it was just the power of suggestion and the placebo. Yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, I mentioned Candace Pert. Um, by the way, uh, we we talked about Pert. Not you and I, but um, my sister in law Yona and I talked about it the week before you came on board. And uh, Candace Pert uh, was a researcher at Johns Hopkins University. She was actually one of the leaders there, and she was all that's where she got her PhD. And she also was a major research chief at the National Institutes of Health. So she was, you know, a pretty big, big wig, so to speak. One of the things that she mentioned in kind of in passing in her book uh, was the power of this kind of thing, of, of the placebo effect, of the power of the mind, the power of belief, power of, you know, what you think about. And, uh-huh. and as an example, she cited a study where uh, there were uh, flat-chested women, women whose breasts were just very, very small, who wanted to have larger breasts. Right. Uh-huh. And there were drugs that were developed to enhance their breasts, and they even were able to show uh, improvement beyond the placebo effect and so forth. Gave the drugs to these women, and almost to a woman, they just didn't do anything. Huh. And then uh-huh. they tried an experiment where they put the women under a hypnosis, and the, right. the hypnotist basically told them, <clears throat> from now on, <clears throat> excuse me. From now on, your breasts are going to feel warmer, and they're going to feel tingly, and you're going to just feel them expand, and so forth. And almost universally, their breasts got larger. Wow. I mean, that's huge. Well, no, excuse. Yeah. I, I don't mean that. In, <laughs> I said that the <laughs> wrong way, didn't I? <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but it is a big thing to have that kind of an effect. That's really just remarkable. All, yep. I mean, they actually had medications that were designed to produce that result that couldn't produce it as well as the post-hypnotic suggestion did. Wow. Powerful. It's very powerful. So, yeah, you, you have to get past the secret and look into other stuff before the secret starts to make sense. Mm-hmm. I think, anyway. Mm-hmm. That, that's my opinion on it. But uh, they do spend a lot of time uh, trying to lay the groundwork for the secret in chapter one and i i give them credit for that because they're at least trying to provide a foundation that people can use to understand and appreciate what's going on with all this secret stuff this oh, yeah. stuff. Mm-hmm. so that that's i think the, the greatest plot i can give 
um, on the book. I mean, now you said you had already been exposed to all this because of your exposure to Michael Bernard Beckwith. Um, when you were reading the book or seeing the movie, I don't know what you did first. Um, what was your first impression of the first chapter? Was it like, yeah, I got that. I'm moving on. Was it, I got something new out of it. How did it work for you? Um, I mean, it was a while ago, so I don't remember exactly, but from what I do remember, yeah, I was pretty, I resonated with it pretty well, uh, you know, already. So it's like, this is confirmation of what I've heard before from, from Beckwith. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you, it was easy for and you I, then. The first chapter wasn't the, the trauma it was for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was not the trauma. <laughs> so that makes it easier for sure. No. no wonder you went into the field, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but you also sound a lot more scientific than me. Like, I don't know, I personally don't necessarily have to go to all research and scientific places. Like, I, if something just kind of resonates with me and I trust that, then it's you, you just know, buy into it, and you're ready. You're done. You're ready to move on to the next thing. This, at least with Law of Attraction, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, yeah. There's one other thing that's interesting, too. Lisa Nichols, one of the presenters, makes a very interesting comment. And we could probably do an entire show on this comment, I think. She mm -hmm. says, mm -hmm. thank God that there's a time delay, that all of your thoughts don't come true instantly. We'd be in trouble if they did. <laughs> the element of time delay serves you. It allows you to reassess, to think about what you want, and to make a new choice. Yeah, Abraham Esther Hicks also says that. Like she, she always says, you don't want everything at once. It would be way too much, way too hard. <laughs> so, I think the uh, be thankful for the time delay. If yeah. I remember correctly, the visual in the movie, there was a guy sitting in his living room, and he he sees a picture of an elephant, and all of a sudden there's an elephant in the living room, leaving. <laughs> elephant patties on the floor. <laughs> yeah. So, so I agree. I yeah. really don't want to have an elephant appear in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand, there is something to the whole topic about time delay being a useful topic, I think, because mm -hmm. of what the nature of the time delay is. That was one of my questions. Right. When I first saw this, the secret, I said, okay. Well, I can see how a time delay would be an explanation about why it is things don't seem to happen right away. Mm -hmm. But what is the time mm -hmm. delay? That's what I wanted to know. What causes it? Mm -hmm. what, what makes time be delayed? And uh, Dr. Joe Vitale, he, he stepped in next and he said, you want to be aware of your thoughts and choose your thoughts carefully, and you want to have fun with this because you are the masterpiece of your own life. You are the Michelangelo, the David. You are sculpting as you. Uh, and he said that in the context of trying to downplay the delay and not be too worried mm -hmm. about the delay. That mm -hmm. actually didn't work for me. I needed to understand that delay. I needed to understand why it happens. <laughs> See, but, but, you're, but by doing that, though, then you're kind of keeping yourself in the delay. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I know that now, yeah. and, and, yeah. and that's true. But we also have to remember that it's important to meet the student at the student's level. If all they really had to do was explain what the delay was caused by, and I would have been able to yeah. move past it. Yeah, true. That's you true. know. Yeah, yeah. And 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 yeah. if I had to put it, you you tell me if you think this matches your understanding. The time delay yeah. is our resistance. The time delay is how much we resist whatever it is that we really think we're trying to attract. And and how that's exactly what I was going to say. It is okay. Yeah. So we're on the the, the same yeah. level here. Yeah, the, and, the, the, and people have different resistance levels about different things. So the less resistance you have about money, the more you're going to start attracting money. Right. The rest, you know, the less resistance you have about attracting a relationship, the more the relationship's going to manifest. Now here's the real rub where the whole thing is concerned. When I first started exploring the secret, I had resistances I didn't know existed. Yeah, that makes sense. Absolutely. And I still have yeah. them. I, I'm still recognizing them. They still emerge. I find new yeah. ones all the time. But yeah. when you're first exploring all this stuff and you aren't aware of your own resistances, <laughs> that, that can be very yeah, confusing. Do. Ab absolutely. That can be really confusing because you're trying. You know, you're, you're, you're putting out, I want, I want this. I want to attract this. I love having that. And it doesn't come to you. And you say, well, this doesn't work. <laughs> because you aren't yeah. aware of your own resistances. Yeah. That this this yeah. is really important stuff. So I, I really think they need to spend more time on the resistances. Yeah, yeah, and of course, 
the minute you in your mind go to well, the how how or when is this going to happen? Yeah, that in itself is resistance. resistance. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like here's resistance on top of the resistance. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but you got to understand the concept, otherwise you can't begin to deal with it. You know, if you yeah, have an, if true. you're a person who is naturally positive, a person who just throughout from, from the moment you were born, everything you looked at, you looked at positively, then this stuff makes total sense to you. So, so, so when you're first presented with it, you're saying, "Well, yeah, of course. I, you know, I, the, I can see why there'd be a time delay. I'm not worried about it. I'm just going to move on. No yeah. big deal." Yeah. If you don't have that background, though, and so many people don't, so many, many, so many people are taught by our society, indirectly or directly, to be negative. So uh-huh. their experience and is I... negativity, and they have a bunch of resistances built up. They need to know it's the resistances that's stopping things. Yeah. Yeah, plus two, from my own experiences and a lot of people I talk to, resistance and a lot of the law of attraction information, you kind of get at deeper levels as time goes on. Like you first think, oh, I understand that. And then like six months later, you're like, oh, now I get yeah. it even more. <laughs> now I really have it. And then six months later, you're like, oh, now I even get it more. <laughs> it's like we, we fill in you the gaps. You kind of get it at deeper levels yeah. as time goes on. Yeah, we fill in gaps in our information, and each little piece just adds to the feeling of understanding. Yeah. Like that's, that's what I yeah. call the, the getting deeper. Getting deeper is really just filling in the gaps. Well, even with resistance, like when I kind of similar to you, when I first heard, I mean, I kind of understood it, and I thought I did. And then, like, as time went on, like, I just had a better understanding and better, you know, and now I have a much better clearer understanding of it than I did several years ago. So, and who knows, years from now, I might even have a better understanding. Well, I'm sure you will, because just, as time goes you on. You kind of get it at deeper levels. We, we, yeah. we, under, we, we, we learn through experience more and more and more different ways that we can offer up resistance. And so we start accumulating like this pile of information. Oh, wow, look at all the different ways it can happen. <laughs> Yeah. Whereas when we yeah. start, it's like, well, yeah, I guess I can resist something somewhere. <laughs> yeah, and then like, well, you know what I mean. I'm sure other people listening do too. You just get it more yeah. as time goes on. Sure, because the the more that you accumulate knowledge wise, the more it starts to make sense. Mm-hmm. The more that, mm-hmm. you know, oh, of course, of course. Well, why didn't I notice that before? You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But thank God you notice it now, you know. <laughs> One of the things my sister-in-law, Yuona, and I talked about a number of times on this show was the role that our brain plays in filtering out experiences. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. It's, it's really important that it does that. Uh, people who cannot filter out experiences are actually considered to have m- uh, mental conditions, mental illness. Um now what do you what do you mean filter out experiences? What do you mean by that? We actually experience a lot more stuff than we recognize consciously. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. So, yeah, for instance, uh, a, a, a classic example of that would be you go out and you buy a new car, and let's say you buy I like Toyota, so let's say you buy a Toyota, and all of a right. sudden, all the cars seem to be Toyotas. <laughs> yeah. Now the yeah, Toyotas were always yeah. there. Yeah. But because your yeah. filtering didn't let them in, you didn't notice yeah. them. Another yeah. example is um, th- this is kind of an inverse example. I want you to not see anything red. And as soon as I say <laughs> that, the first red. thing you see is red. <laughs> yeah. Because you start noticing but that, red. That, but your car example is so true because when I got my latest car, I never heard of that model before. Ah. And then once I test drove it and heard of it, guess what? Suddenly I'm noticing them all over the yes. place, and I never noticed them before. Mm-hmm. It's true. <laughs> it's true. So, yeah. And, in fact, people who are unable to filter stuff out because the filtering mechanism isn't filtering, we have a word for that, autism. Mm. That's what autism mm. is. From the perspective of an autistic person, they are inundated with so much sensory input that they can't handle it. Wow. It, it, it's really quite so a they, thing. They don't have that ability. Yeah, yeah, because that key portion of their brain isn't functioning the way it's supposed to. So it's like the filter's missing. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that filter is actually mm-hmm. critically important. It helps keep us sane. It helps us to navigate the world. But it also right. informs us that what we focus on tends to be what we, fil- what we let through the filter and what we avoid focusing on tends to get filtered out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Which is both a positive thing in terms of not driving us crazy, but it's also a positive right. thing in terms of recognizing that we can change our experiences. Yes. Because all we have to do is yes. change what we're focusing on, and that stuff starts coming through. And we can we can mm-hmm. take our attention away from stuff we don't want, and that stuff stops coming through. And from a law of attraction perspective, when we change what we're focusing on, then that change suddenly be other thoughts come in and more you know that support that that's right that, that better that better focus and other thoughts come in so yeah it's really so this becomes the way to overcome to resistance you know going back to the question of resistance now that we understand what resistance is to some degree how do we go about getting rid of it well we get rid of it by changing what we focus on mm-hmm. in other words we mm-hmm. change the way we we reprogram the way our filtering mechanism works what it focuses on letting through what it focuses on blocking out and just by changing yeah. that, by, by sort of adjusting that, by deciding what we're going to pay attention to, we end up getting rid of the resistance. Yeah. Every time we focus more on what we want, we're knocking down that resistance. Every, every time we deliberately keep ourselves feeling good, we're knocking down resistance. Right. And contrary, That's every time we focus important. on what we don't want, we build up the we're resistance. We're building it up. Yep. Yep. So that becomes our volume control. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really important to get. Like anyone who is into law of attraction, you, you know, it's so important to get that we always want to be in as less of a resistance state as possible. Well, I think that once you understand the resistance component, you get that part. The hard part is figuring yeah. out how do you do that. What's the practical way yeah. to do that? And, well, and, and that's why I like you know, this whole idea. One of our shows, we can talk about. Well, yeah, I have many ways. Well, that, that's why yeah. I said the whole time delay thing is a whole show. You could do probably five shows on it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the but, I want it now. I want everything yeah. now. <laughs> oh yeah. But the good thing is that since it is something that we can control through what we focus on, now at least we have yes. a starting point. Mm-hmm. Okay, so mm-hmm. I, there may be things I'm resistant to that I don't. I don't even know what they are. Right. Right. Good news is I don't have to worry about that. No. Good news is I just no. changed my focus to what it is I want and deliberately yeah. pay attention whenever I'm focusing on something I don't want and say, oh, I did it again. Time to shift it over what I want <laughs> and do that over and over and again. And then flip it. Yep, and then flip it to what you do want. And, and the more that we do that, the more the resistance goes away. Exactly. And exactly. That, that's why it works for somebody like you because you never worried about the resistance. It does, which is good. It's, it's yeah. a very good thing. Yeah, but I still had to know about it and understand it and figure out what to do to be less resistant anyway. And to help other people to lose their resistance because you're a coach. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> That's a big part of your That's life. Right. Yes, yes. Yeah, resistance is a culprit. <laughs> it's a culprit, and it, yes. it's, it's where we feel like the universe is working against us when it's really just ourselves. Because I know I experienced mm-hmm. that. I thought before I discovered the secret, the law of attraction, I really thought there was, you know, some negative demon out there who was destroying my life. <laughs> wow! Yeah, yeah. And my wife yeah. discovered it pretty early on and and told me, "No, it's not out there. It's inside you." What do you mean? I, mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't have any demons inside me. <laughs> well, I, they yeah. are demons in a sense. The resistance, is, in a sense, is a form of a demon. It basically blocks me from what it is I'm trying to get into my life. Yeah. So in that yeah. sense, it's true. But in reality, it was within me, and it was. It, and the good news is that it gives me the power. Because once I have the power, yeah. once I know what I need to do in order to make the change, first of all, I don't have to worry about the demon anymore. Mm-hmm. And second of all, mm-hmm. I can actually feel empowered. Isn't that what the modern word is these days? Everybody wants to be more empowered. empowered empowerment. <laughs> Well, empower is a good word. It is a yeah. good word. We, we all want to feel empowered. We, we grow up in a society that disempowers us. So, of course, yeah. we hunger after it. Of course, we crave having more power, more direct influence over our own lives. And that's mm-hmm. probably what makes The Secret so successful. Because Absolutely. for a lot of people, yeah. it was the first time that they realized they actually do have power over their own circumstances. Yep. Yeah. Yep, and that and that we can actually be a deliberate creator. Yes. We can, like, we don't have to. We're not just victims to what happens. That's right. You know, we we can we can take more control of it. We can we can take work. We can 
we, we can basically move in all the directions we've always wanted to move in but felt like somebody was going to block us. That's right. Well, that's right. once you know that you, the only person who can block you is you, mm-hmm. now that's pretty empowering because that means that, that evil boss can't block you thoughts. and that, that parent who's in your way can't block you and that teacher who's giving you a hard time can't block you and all the people mm-hmm. that we blame for blocking us, they can't block us anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the ultimate empowerment. Yes, yes. And resistance is so important to understand and know what to do to reduce it. So what's your favorite method for reducing resistance? In your life, I mean. Um, I guess for me, it's kind of what you talked about earlier, where when I do catch myself thinking about something in a more low vibration way or negative way, mm-hmm. is being aware enough to realize that and then in the moment flip it to what I do want. So, okay, David, well, what do you want about X? And then, and then like legitimately forcing myself with my thoughts to focus on what I want, on what I want, and what I want over whatever it was I was thinking about before that. And that really works. Like when you really do it in the moment, it really, you can feel it in your body that like a relief it's like oh okay yeah this feels much better oh yes it's empowering and and it gives you an instant reaction that that's one thing we all want we want to have that instant result Mm -hmm. the instant result Mm -hmm. is that you feel better you know just by practicing what what abraham hicks calls the pivot that that's what you were describing Mm -hmm. was the pivot just absolutely you you, you notice you thought about something negative and you try to find the the silver lining or the positive way to look at it (laughs) and when you do that the first especially the first time you're like oh i finally did it and then you do it the second or third time. It's like, okay, I'm getting a rhythm going here. This is good. You know? Yes. And I, and I just think that's one of the biggest differences of people who know about law of attraction and really know how to work with it compared to people that don't. It's not that necessarily you're always thinking positively and only wonderful things are happening for you. But it's the difference is that when something does happen or you do catch yourself thinking more negatively, that we know what to do about it in the moment. That we don't stay there. Right. That, and, and that it's not a big deal that you have to go through. It's a little deal. It's just exactly. finding one silver lining. If you can find that one exactly. silver lining, and it can be challenging to find that silver lining, particularly the first few times. But when you find it and you voice it, few things happen. First of all, your negative friends find some way to make it negative again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you start to notice that you're in a different space from them. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of weird all by That's itself, right. you know. But also, That's right. and, and then, but but also, it, when you first start turning it around like that, you feel like you're finally taking that control that we were talking about earlier. Yes, yes, and and like all the law of attraction information and processes, it just takes practice, 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 and the, you know, the more you practice reducing resistance, you know, the better you get at it, and and the better you get at it the more positive results you're going to have. And that's basically life in a nutshell right there. Well, we only got a minute or yeah. so left. Let's let's uh, do our wrap-up. First of all, I want to remind everybody that uh, you can find us all the time here on PRN, of course. Um, but you can also subscribe to our podcast at LOAToday.net. We are on Apple iTunes. You can find us in the iTunes store. Uh, you can find us on YouTube. You can find us on Facebook. We, we Twitter our tweets uh, periodically, too. So there's a lot of ways you can find us. And, uh, David, for people who want your coaching, how do they reach you? Sure. Anybody who's interested can go to lifecoachdavid.com, and they can read more about me. And if they're interested in uh, coaching, they can find out how to contact me at lifecoachdavid.com. Sounds great. David, we got Chapter 1 out of the way. We'll be doing Chapter 2 next week. Are you looking forward to it? Okay. I'm ready. I'm psyched, too. So yeah. thank you once again for joining me today. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for having we'll me. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.